Uh, so, yeah, so this talk is called It's All Function Variables, and it's uh, my perspective on what makes programming programming. So, uh, I'm Zypher, that's pretty much what everyone who knows me knows me as, because all my friends are on the internet. Um, but since we're all friends here, you can call me Michael, because Zypher is really hard to say. And uh, so, I love community stuff uh, as part of this. I'm one of the co-organizers of the CSSConf AU, and I run one of the, uh, with a friend of mine, I run one of the bigger front-end meetups, or CSS-specific meetups in Melbourne, called Melb CSS. And I'm a big fan of open source stuff. Uh, I've been doing it for probably six or seven years now, and the most relevant to this, I guess, is I work on LibSAS, which is the C++ implementation of Ruby SAS, to try and give SAS a bit of a speed boost. And uh, I am now the project lead of NodeSAS. Um, so this is not a talk about SAS. I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you how SAS is awesome and why it convince you to try and use SAS, because it's not that kind of talk. Uh, this talk is actually a story. And it's a story about how my life got flipped turned upside down. <laughs> so I'd like to take a minute, just sit right there, and tell you how I became a real programmer. So I want to start with a quick question. Can I, everyone just raise their hands to start? <laughs> uh, and how many of you would consider yourselves programmers? Uh, and how many of you have written a function or a mixin or if statement in SAS or less or JavaScript? Uh, so if you've done any of those things, put your hand down. So who is not a programmer and who has never written a loop or a function? Awesome, so you're all experts. Uh, practically done here, but this is a story, and we're going to go back to the um, dream scene, where we go back to a, when the protagonist was like a little child, and this is kind of a little story about my background in programming. In Australia, we have a thing called the pen license. So in your final year of primary school, so grade six, of about age of 12, every week you sit kind of a test, and that test is to test your handwriting skills, skills and your cursive, because at this point, you've only written in pencil in school. So you have to earn the privilege to use a pen. And uh, so I was the last to get this. And I'm pretty sure I got it purely out of obligation, not because I earned it. Uh, and the funny thing about this is, before I was allowed to write my homework in pen, I was fluent in two programming languages. So it's kind of this thing where I've gone through this journey where I've been writing code for about 15 years, and people have been foolish have been paying me to do it for about 12 years. So I started, I was really lucky and started like stupidly young programming, and you know, I was writing in variations of basic, and then I kind of discovered this HTML thing, and I was using Notepad, and I was pretty excited. And then we hit like the first years of high school, and we started working on things like Visual Basic and Python and looking into C, and that were interesting to me. Uh, so, but later on, I got obsessed with interactive thing. I wanted to build things that moved and animated and, went, and you could do really cool things with. And this was like things like Macromedia Flash, which before Adobe was, Macro, was Flash, it was really exciting to me. So I could animate things and see them come to life. Uh, then comes to university and, come to university and we have to learn Java. But in all this time, I started doing PHP and like, that was my gateway to the web. Like, PHP was so approachable, so easy. And then I got a job, and that job required me to learn jQuery. Not JavaScript, jQuery. I'll be honest about it, like, my first foray into like front end was doing a lot of jQuery with PHP. And this same job meant I did some C Sharp. And how these things two related, I don't know. But people were paying me to do these things, so, you know, I have code out there that's C Sharp, but I don't recommend anyone using. Later in that job, I started hacking on some Ruby code. And then like, this transition happened. Over the space of like, two or three years, I just really got back into the web. I wanted to move towards the front end. It's where I saw the harder problems, where the fun came into it. And in this like, really short burst of time, you know, I was learning CSS3 and HTML5 and JavaScript. And then when you start doing these things, you start using Node because you have to use your grunt and your gulp. And then if you're doing a lot of front end, perform front -end stuff, you, you, know, you want to do performance, so you start looking at like, your engines, and, like how Apache and Nginx work. And then later on in the story, you see Sass gets so unwieldy, you're like, ah, oh, I'll do some Sass, it'll be awesome, it'll be fast. You know, now we skip to today and we're using, ah, oh, React, it'll fix all my problems, it's great. And like, 
this looks like a, a crazy amount of stuff to be doing, a crazy amount of languages. And it's not to say anyone is fluent in all these things. Like, it takes them like 10,000 hours to be like fluent in a language and understand how language works. But a lot of these languages are a thing called C-style languages. Like, languages evolve over time. And a lot of these evolve from like the C, the C roots, which is from like 1989 is like the first major, major C, I think, uh, 86. So this is C++ code, but it's just because strings in C are hard and the, my slides weren't big enough. Um, so it's kind of like a simple image error function. We see them in Compass. We see them in like a bunch of SAS libraries. And you take a base image and it's like, oh, you know, I want to find an image to foo, but in my environment, my base string might change between different production. So we just kind of, you know, we got a function, an image URL, we're passing a string, and two strings, or returning that string. And like, all is well. But if you look to like JavaScript, like the difference here is so tiny. Like we've removed types, so you're no longer saying this is a string, but you just, you put the word var to say this is a variable. You know, your function is almost exactly the same. You're only calling with the same syntax. You, know, you then move to like uh, PHP, and it's almost exactly the same. You've dropped the var and put dollar sign. And this is how people are able to like pick up new languages. Like it's always your first one that's hard. You know, we look at things like SAS now, and SAS is exactly the same. Like we kept the PHP dollar signs, and in front of function we put app symbols. But all in all, these things are kind of the same thing. Like there's not a learning curve. Like every language has its own ism, which is like this is how you should program in this language. You know, in in, job, in JavaScript, you use prototypes. You know, try not to use classes. Use decorators. You know, PHP is now you try and use lots of classes, but procedural if you can. And then we come to like the, the next level. These are all C-based languages. This is like Ruby, and they've just dropped all superfluous stuff. You know, you longer, you don't like have vars or dollar signs. You no longer have the function keywords replaced with def because it's shorter. You know, your return statements are optional, uh, but you're calling the function pretty the exact same way. You're looking at all these languages. You can kind of figure out what's going on pretty quickly. So this kind of gets you thinking. It's like, how hard can all this stuff really be? Um, you know, a lot of the ideas of programming to this, this kind of branch of languages, which is like most modern languages now are all kind of C, uh, you know, uh, children of the C, descendants of C languages. Um, so, so it gets pretty easy. And like the difference is really syntax and isms, but you can get there pretty quickly. So over time, a lot of my, I gave a lot of talks for a lot of years and did a lot of open source work. And the tone of those projects changed from like back end stuff to like front end stuff. And I start going to meetups and talking about this stuff and how exciting it was. And I, the tone of my conversation, uh, the tone of my conversation started to change. And I started getting questions like, oh, "Are you a designer? Uh, why don't you do some real programming?" And this was super weird to me because, like, I'd written production code for about ten years at this point in a lot of these languages. And in the front end, we have a lot of the same problems. You know, we have the same maintainability, scalability, balance. You know, this code works, but can can I maintain it in two years' time? Can someone else read this code? You know, you still have the same kind of operations issues and performance issues, like is this using fresh memory? You know, we, you have, we have paints and layouts, but on the server you have memory consumption and CPU cycles and am I blocking requests? And, but the thing we do have in the browser you don't see on the server side is that we have non-standard environments. Like we're writing code, it's one of the most hostile environments. You know, on the server we're predictable. We have an, a, probably an Ubuntu machine running a version of Ruby or PHP that we know, and like we know code is going to run there because that's our environment. And here we're looking at browsers all over the world, very network conditions. Like the problem set seemed a lot harder than the back end. So it was kind of weird to me that people thought this is like an easy child's play kind of thing. And it's hard to change people's minds without understanding their point of view. So you talk to them for a while and it kind of came to clear to me after a while that this was all a side effect of something called the Dunning Kruger effect or Dunning Kruger. And it's kind of two parts. And the two and it's kind of like people who don't really know a thing or kind of know the basics of a thing can extrapolate from that and look, ah, oh, I know the basics, obviously the harder parts aren't that hard. It's like not knowing enough to know how hard something is. And a lot of us may have experienced this earlier today with our Leah's talk, and you see, oh, it's a pie chart, we have a circle, we use another circle, like how hard can it really be? And you start digging into details, you realize this is actually really insanely complicated, but you have to give it that time and effort to get there. And the other flip side of this is uh, people who really know something, oh, yeah, conversely, people who really know something kind of overestimate everybody else's skill and say, well, this is easy. How come you don't know how to do this? Like, this has become second nature to you now over time. It's like, oh, well, you should be doing these things. It's really easy. Yeah. And it's easy to understand why people don't see front end as a really hard thing. If we look at like the day of 
CS, the, the day of web design article came out 15 years ago. You know, since then we've had like every couple of years we get something new like CSS3 and HTML5, then responsive development, then preprocessors. With that came build chains like Grunt and Gulp. Then the big focus on WebPerf, and then the uh, web extensible, extensible web manifestos, and now we have like fluent comps and CSS comps, and then the 60 frames per second thing, and now it's like HTTP2. These are a lot of things to keep up to date with if you have not touched front end since IE6 or just kind of toyed around with some, seen some demos, toyed around some tutorials in your time being. Um, so it's a really great article from Alex Sexton a while ago called Front End Ops. It talks about what it is to be like a front end developer. And I hate quoting things, but I couldn't think of a better way of saying this. It comes down like a front end ops engineer, is someone who cares about external performance, they're critical of like every new request, and they're constantly measuring performance and page load time. They own everything past the functionality. They're the bridge between the application's intent and the application's reality. Yeah. And their responsibility is they handle things like migrations of new versions and external internal dependencies up to date, security and stability, you know, the gatekeepers application. And this is like a wide berth like front end. It's not just CSS and JavaScript. It's, you're responsible for every byte from your server side code to the user and all the ramifications of that, including the rendering performance after the browser, which we'll hear talks about uh, later on. So we skip ahead now to uh, modern era. And uh, in 2011, I started a company called 99designs. And at this time, we had no front end team. Um, the UI is clearly ad hoc. It's kind of evolved over like four or five years with a bunch of back end devs hacking on UI when they needed it. And we've gone through multiple rebrands. So the further you went through like certain pages, you could see older and older versions of the site. This weird archaeological dig was pretty interesting. So in 2012, we had to attack a responsive rebrand. Uh, so as this, we decided, all right, let's fix our CSS issues. Let's really get serious about this. And uh, we forked foundation. I started our own internal framework. And this is where we kind of bet big on SaaS. Because we pretty early on ran into problems with foundation. And we started building our own UI framework. And with this kind of stuff, when you start bringing in SaaS, you start bringing in asset pipelines. And if you start doing a lot of Ruby stuff, a lot of asset pipelines, this is like early days of Grunt, you realize things get really slow. The developer experience is slow, the UX is slow, live reloads don't really work. And we can no longer do like in request compilations. So 2014 comes around, and now we're like multiple teams. And with multiple teams, we have multiple asset pipelines, because each dev has their own way of doing things, kind of forked from the previous generation. And we just had more CSS, which means slower and slower compilations. Like at one point, we we're down to like eight minute compilation times on a fresh compilation. That's just our SAS. And that was kind of crazy. Uh, I was, I'd had enough. Um, I'd heard of LibSAS. And I made this card. It was kind of like a pipe dream. You know, I labeled it I have a dream that one day we'll have LibSAS compatibility. And it really started with one to do item, it was just maps. And I figured if we have that, we're so close. I feel like that was missing. As you can see from this card, like it wasn't even the beginning what was missing. And this goes on for like another page of like all the little bugs we came into trying to get LibSAS working in our thing. So it was kind of like this excitement and then this like disappointment. And we thought we were close and then we weren't. Um, you know, it was missing so many basic features that like polyfills weren't even possible. Um, the development of the project was really slow. It was, it was one person working on it in there, you know, on like company 10% time. It wasn't really going anywhere anywhere quickly. And it was in C, and this is kind of a problem that I thought could be worked around. Like, surely if somebody rewrites this thing, you know, as a Node developer, we rewrite everything in Node, because Node developers like rewriting everything in Node, that you know, front-end devs know Node, they're at Node C, they'll start writing more Node. If we make it you know, generic enough of a tool, people will start adding features in, and like, it won't be one person's job, it'll be a community job, and we'll get there really fast. And so this is kind of my idea. I, kind of, I got really serious about this. I did a lot of studying on compilers, and interpreters and how it all works internally. Um, but I kind of put it aside. It's something I kind of really thought about, but didn't really have the motivation to start working on yet. So in 2014, I, uh, we ran the first CSS conference AU in Australia. And I went to hang out with Chris Epstein, who is one of the main contribu core contributors to uh, Ruby SAS, uh, which was the SAS at the time. And you know, I used this opportunity as one of the organizers to practically stalked this person. I was following him around, asking him questions, looking at everything he knew. Like, how could I make Libs, how could we get there? How, what was, why was Libs, why was SAS slow? How could we make it better? Um, so later that year, uh, there was a thing called Camp SAS run by uh, Hampton Caitlin, who was the original like inventor of SAS and the inventor behind Libs SAS. 
And at Camp SAS, uh, Aaron Leung talk, and he was, he was the person who actually writes LibSAS. And I talked to these people, and I, you know, I asked them, why is this thing in C? Like, can, can we do this better as a community? Like, what is the end goal here? And there are a lot of good reasons for writing this in C now that you know, I know. And it was the right decision at the time. But I talked to Caitlin about, Hampton Caitlin, about my idea of like, how can, like, could I write this in Node? Like, would it be better? Would, would the project move faster? And his answer was, you can do this in Node, but just know this is like a use of your life. Like, there are edge cases we don't even know about. There's a case we don't know about, you know. And I, so I asked him, why is this slow? Can we get faster? Will it ever be ready for us? Um, and he came back with this, which someone else mentioned earlier today. The intersection of people who write C++ and care about CSS, at this point was exactly one person, and that was Aaron. <laughs> and he had a job. So uh, I went back to Australia, uh, really kind of thought about my um, Node SAS idea, and eventually figured I'd just bite the bullet. Like, I've done a bunch of languages, I've toyed with C, like how hard can C++ be? Um, but you know, I didn't know C++, and I was afraid of it. Like To me, this was a realm of real programmers. People write C++ write games and operating systems, like you know, Windows and Doom, and this is like, really intense stuff that I'd never even, I'd shied away from, like legitimately scared. So this was kind of a big off-putting thing for me. Like, how can I contribute to this project? How can I get it where I want it to get and you know, not run screaming for the hills? Uh, so we figured we should jump into it, right, see how it goes. And uh, so it's getting started. There's a lot of things in C that I vaguely remembered from like my time at university and playing around with it. And there's things like linters and linkers and the fact that it's a compiled language. And this is different from every language I showed earlier was like interpreted. So you can just kind of like run a command and it ran. You didn't have to compile anything. There was no binary distribution. You didn't care about operating systems. If you had Ruby, it worked. If you had PHP, it worked. Um, but the cool thing about this is I realized this thing they didn't have to know. You don't have to know these things to get started on these projects. They don't really matter. You can generally run like your make file and it'll just work. So the other challenge was make files. Like these are really foreign syntaxes. Is that if you ever saw something on C, you do like slash configure and then make, and then you have a library. And no one really knows, like a few people know how this works, at least definitely not on front end. It's now becoming a bit of a thing, but you know, you kind of link these things back to things you know. And make was kind of like grunt. Um, you know, in fact, grunt was heavily inspired by make. It was the make for the front end. And it kind of made it easier once you knew like the idea of like how this thing works, you map back to your knowledge. And then you have preprocess directives. This is another scary thing. And if you look at code, you kind of it seems simple enough. It's like a hash and include. Then you have like angle brackets. Sometimes you have quotes, and they're pretty much interchangeable, and that's kind of confusing. And they're not just simple includes. Like they're not. They're, you could think of them like as imports, because in this case, include isn't at the import. It's the most common. Uh, Preprocess directive, so it's the only one you have to worry about. And screaming through the libsas source code it was the only thing that really kind of mattered. And the difference between like, sorry, quotes and angle brackets is if you think of like Bower or Node or Browserify uh, load paths. You know, having uh, quotes means load this directly right in this directory relative to where I am, and the angle brackets mean, all right, well, if you can't find it here, go through my load path, do the whole like require just thing or the node require, and eventually find this thing in my path somewhere. So once you knew that, it was kind of uh, pretty straightforward. And the other kicker is that this was strictly typed. Uh, none of the languages I'd see, used earlier outside of uh, the C was uh, strictly typed. And by saying I did C, I did C for like, I read a book on it and probably hacked on it for three months before I got bored and was on the Python. Uh, so this is kind of what, um, similar example we saw before. And you see, you're declaring what this thing is. You're saying base URL is a string. And that matters because you're passing strings around, you're getting strings back, you're adding strings together. And this is essentially the same code here. Um, there's, there's a lot of really great advantages in type safety that I'll go into later. Uh, it's kind of not the greatest thing for everyday work, but it's great for what I have to do here. And I made getting into this project really easy. Then we had things like header files. And these are also kind of, never really understood them, they're kind of scary. And in libsass, they mix like code that shouldn't be in header files inside header files, so it made it ever more confusing. But if you think this is like your bow.json file, it's like, this is essentially kind of like a dependency. This is the thing that I'm going to use later. Um, this is, you know, assume that it will be there, and if it's not, like really nothing's going to happen. So you can kind of overheader, and nothing's going to be bad about it. Um, so I wanted to jump in and get this map. So I figured if I get maps, we're there, we're 90% of the way there, it's going to be beautiful, and everything's going to work. Um, so 
if you don't know what maps are in SAS, I'm going to be quickly into it. So CSS has a thing called uh, the shorthand properties, which in SAS are called lists. You know, you're at one pixel solid red. It's a list of three items that we can manipulate later. And they're all throughout CSS. So we can get an item out of a list like this by calling it nth for getting the first item out of it. Um, unlike most programming languages, SAS is one, uh, one index space or zero index space. Uh, so then you have maps. And maps are like lists, but they're kind of like, think of the longhand syntax of CSS, where it's like a hash map or an array in PHP. You can kind of like just get a key and get the value out. And you have a similar API where it's like, oh, get me this to the key. Like I can have the same flexibility as list, but I can name the thing I'm getting, which is much easier. Um, so I wanted to get started, and the easiest way to get started is to write a thing we call SASPEC. SASPEC is a libsas test suite. Essentially, it's like you write SAS and the CSS you expect. Uh, if it works, everything kind of magically worked. So I figured, you know, even if I can't get this sorted, I can write this PR and get somewhere. So this is this. This got merged, and it was PR44, which goes to show how slow Dev on LibSAS was at the time, and how few contributors were in this project. And when this got merged, I think it was really important to celebrate the small wins. Like even if I even if I couldn't do this code, I gave someone a leg up to be able to get there at some point. But then I really wanted to get to the C++ side of things. I figured I had some time, I could solve this problem. So I uh, followed a, I followed an idea of like. Uh, CPDD, similar to like TDD, and see if you can follow what this actually means. So this is real code from my original PR, and it's worth noting that if you have a look at these things, you'll see a pattern. And if anyone can spot the pattern on like how my map code works? How about now? Or this one. If you'll notice, everywhere you see the word map, you see the word list above it. Because maps are essentially lists, but rather than having like uh, an integer-based index, you have, uh, for the most part, strings, but in SAS or any object. So I did what's called copy-paste-driven development. I grabbed the libsas, I grabbed the libsas source code for the word list, duplicated it, changed it to map, and you know, in some cases, the logic was a bit different. You know, Instead of getting integers, I had strings. I kind of like copied and pasted code where I saw what strings looked like, and I just did it, and it compiled, and it was amazing. And uh, <laughs> you know, of course, maps didn't work because the, I haven't written a parse yet, but I could I got it to compile, and that was really exciting because that is hard. Um, so then I went to the next step of my development, which was CEDD. And so when you get an error in a good error in SAS, or this is now LibSAS. You get like a really descriptive idea, of like, oh, this thing is out of bounds, like I know where to look for this code, it gives me an idea. When you get errors in C++, generally you get something like this, which is like, this is broken, figure it out. And uh, there is a lot of that, uh, especially when I know what you're doing. Uh, eventually I figured out I could use GDB and like get a lot of cryptic output. You know, with a lot of like, really scary looking things like syscalls and symbols and OS archive. But it just looks scary with two or three commands. I now have this uh, stack trace, the thing we had in original code. Like, it's not the most easy thing to read, but like it tells me that somewhere in this stack trace uh, at eval, I had an error. Uh, once you discovered that, things got a lot easier. But it took a long time to get there. It was a lot of like, what is happening? Why is this happening? Just screaming at the compiler. And this is what I call Compiler error driven development. And this is the advantage of uh, LibSAS being statically typed is if it generally, once it compiled, it generally worked. Uh, aside from like seg faults where you reach into memory that wasn't yours, if you could get it to compile, you know, because it was strictly typed, things eventually just kind of worked. And that's kind of my philosophy today. I keep bashing on it until the compiler stops yelling and then the test pass and magically it works. Um, so, ship it. I wrote a PR with the code I'd written over the last uh, month of work, uh, and foolishly got accepted. Uh, people were happy, and you know, this got announced at SASConf, and you know, everyone was excited. We all kind of parted together. It was great. Um, there was one kind of big problem. Uh, it was that I write my C like I write my SAS, because that's what I was mapping it to. So a map get function is native, and if you've ever done a hash, you should know that if you get a key, you can just kind of pull that key out in constant time. 
but because I copied all the list code and list codes were lists or vectors and not hash maps, my first implementation was kind of iterated. I did this, where it's like, ah, oh, here's the map and here's the key. Loop through all the things in this list. When you find the key that matches, just pull that value out. So I just maintain like two, two vectors, one of keys and one of values. And this runs in like in complexity. This is super slow. And the bigger your map gets, the slower this gets. And I knew this was slow. Um, the, on the PR, I said it was slow. I was saying, we probably should have merged this, but this will get someone who knows what they're doing closer. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure in the PR, I said, I don't write C++. Like, you can do better, but this will get you started. Um, but they shipped it anyway, and they were happy to do it. Uh, and this is because of the LibSAS philosophy at the moment. And it's like, performance is a feature. Uh, we, we wanted to, our main goal is to get LibSAS to where SAS is. Uh, performance comes mostly because like C++, and it's awesome. This is magically fast with no work. You know, once we're there, we'll start doing work. But you know, it took very little time for this to happen. And this is actually me opening the bug, but uh, I realized when I ran this over my code at, my, at my, where I worked, it was actually slower than RubySAS, and significantly slower. Because if you do bad architecture, bad engineering, it's slow. Like, C++ isn't going to save you. Uh, and I, I came out and said, I, I was very honest about this and said, like, this is going to be a problem when I wrote it. And Aaron, the main developer at the time, said, this is fine. Like, if it becomes a problem, we'll deal with it later. Like, let's just get this shipped. And like, given our goals, that was like a great mentality. Uh, and it's kind of where I go into, like, yeah, this is linear time. The longer this is, the slower it is. And, you know, this should be a constant time lookup. Should have to get a hash and then get a value out and just be, be the same no matter how big the thing is. And I go into this and say that the performance shouldn't be an issue. It's an issue because I'm a terrible programmer at C, and like this is my first pull request. And hopefully it'll get better. Uh, so I spent about another month or so on this, bashing my head with some help from some friends. And I'm sure we've all seen like this thing, generally in reference to CSS. But more generically, it's like things I don't understand are hard, and are why they're doing this thing to me. And I've had this in every language I've learned, and I've had this seriously in C++ and LibSAS. But we kept iterating over weeks and months, and eventually we had a new PR. And this shows like the before and afters, and you can see that we were running in 11 seconds, where Ruby SAS was running like 1.2 seconds. So like it was slow to do really heavy map stuff. Um, this PR got it down to like under a second, which was faster than Ruby SAS, was still insanely slow, but we we're happy that it was faster. Like that was half our job right there. So we got this shipped, and this is like the second or third version. Now this number is like 200 milliseconds, so it's crazy fast. Um, that took more months of work of finding things I still didn't understand. A lot of us still copy and paste from development, but uh, that's how we roll. And there was partying, we had maps, was, everyone was really excited, you know, we were almost there. And I thought, yeah, my code will run now, we're so close. And 30 or 40 bugs later, um, we finally got there. Uh, skip to today, you know, we're now in present day, you know, coming towards the end of the story. And through a series of poor decisions on other people's behalfs, I am now a core member of LibSAS. Um, <laughs> don't know a lick of C. So this is, well, it's not true anymore. Um, C is less scary. Uh, I'm also the Node SAS project lead now, which is one of the main uh, gateways to LibSAS. You know, the, the great thing about LibSAS being in C is it's embeddable. So we have bindings in almost every language. I mean, it's nice to rewrite all the SAS logic because that is easier of your life. I can attest to that. And I'm up here on stage. Like, people thought it would be great to fly me across the world to talk about like how I turned SAS into C++, which is great. Like, I think we should all do it. Like, don't be afraid of the big boy languages. You're a programmer if you can write SAS. So obviously, this is like happily ever after. Like, what does this mean for LibSAS and for programmers everywhere? Um, LibSAS is almost a parody. We keep saying this, so we'll get close, we'll get there, and we're not, we, we will. You know, um, but as for Nano Designs, as of, I've been on holiday for four weeks, and during my holiday I got an email, the last project got converted over to LibSAS. So we're now 100% LibSAS, a uh, year and a half on, uh, a year on after I started on LibSAS development. And C++ is slightly less scary. Um, there are parts of the code I don't touch. Uh, when I do, I copy and paste, and everything kind of works. And I get the, and I, I'm gonna thank these people. I listed Hampton and Chris uh, last week, or two weeks ago, at, in San Francisco at the Mixin. Or these are the people who made this possible, you know. The philosophy of like, ship the code, then do better, you know. If you care enough, you'll become a contributor and you'll start to care more. Right? The more you use it, the more you'll care. 
And luckily, I'm actually running under time, so uh, demo time. We're gonna try this live coding thing, wish me luck. Uh, and we're gonna live code C++. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm gonna show you the true copy and paste driven development. So, we have a, uh, in libsass, we removed the function called compact. It was never part of the spec, but it was in compass originally. And the company who first wrote libsass needed compact, so they just chucked it in there. Like, and we eventually decided to remove it because, you know, we want to be a SAS engine, because you can't do things SAS doesn't do. So I figured, all right, let's create a compact equivalent. And we can see the code here in SAS. Um, we take a list. Uh, I need a reader display. That I do. Uh, wow. Oh, all right, that is not 1080p. All right, I guess that's something to get with VGA. We'll go with it. So we have the compact function. We create a new list. Uh, if the list is empty, then we just return uh, the blank list. It's all good. Uh, so what compact does is remove falsey values, um, things that look like false, which in SAS is empty strings, null, and false. So we kind of loop, th loop through this list. Uh, we assign the value, and we check if that value is false. Uh, if it's not false, we add it to our array, add it to our list, and return the list. Pretty simple. Um, we have a test here of like a bunch of items in a list, and the results, uh, what we'd expect here is that uh, false and null are removed from this list. So I guess if we just run. Cool, we can see false and null are removed from the list. Uh, actually. Make sure I'm not a liar. We're recompiling libsass, exciting stuff. Cool, so this is running the SAS code. But if we wanna, you know, writing these languages in the interpreter is kind of slow, so you wanna write it in, if you're doing lots of compacts, you wanna write it into the native language. So, you know, if you were so inclined, you could remove this function, uh, try and run this code and you see we spit up the compact string, because in SAS, CSS has functions as well, so if a function is not defined, we assume it to call a native function, like calc or background URL, or sorry, URL. So, all is well. So, the obvious place to start is a file called functions.cpp, and this is how I was developing in the start of uh, libsass, and it's a completely legitimate way to do things. So, there is a function similar to compact, which is, uh, index, and it'll kind of find the first thing in the list. So if we just kind of search for index. Uh, right. Cheap. Yes, yeah, so we have uh, the index function. This looks close to what we're trying to do. You know, it uh, takes a list, loops over that list, uh, returns something at the end. It's pretty close to what we're trying to do, so it's a uh, Copy paste this. This is how it's done, people. Uh, so we're gonna close compact. So let's just rename that to compact. Uh, we don't need a value. We just take a list, so we just get rid of this and just delete some code here. Uh, I have no idea what this does, but sure, it's safe. Um, <laughs> go with it. What we do need is a new list. So let's kind of have a look. How do we create new lists? Yep, this looks good. Let's copy that. Let's uh, create a new list here. We'll call it results. Uh, that's not compact. I do that every time. Uh, so cool. So uh, the length is going to be different. So we can just assume that it'll be zero. Uh, I'm going to keep the same separator. Um, right. So what do we want to do here? We want to. If we look at our SAS code here, we want to assign. We want to assign the value in our loop. We want to assign the value to a value. So let's go, uh, how do we create things in this? Let's look at uh, expression, there you go, expression v. So it's like expression uh, value. I push I need a star there. Uh, equals, 
Uh, cool. Yeah, value at L. Looks not legit. Uh, cool. So now you want to, since you want to test if this is true, right? So like, uh, if this has a, if this does have a value, we'll take our results and just add this value, I guess. Got that. And then uh, we, we'll we return the results. So if we have a look at this. Like, we, if we don't have a list, we're creating a new list, I suppose. Um, we're we're creating, we're creating a new list we're going to return. We loop through all the items in the list. We assign the item we're currently at to a value. If that value is truthy, we add that value to our new list and we return that list. Looks pretty similar to this code. Here's our loop, here's the assignment, here's the if, and here's the append, push it into the list, and here we return. Looks legit to me. Um, odds are this won't compile, but let's give it a shot. Oh, I did compile. All right. But it didn't work. So all right, we know we forked a thing called index. Uh, so let's kind of search for index in our code and see what happens. Uh, these don't look relevant. Uh, Index.c, that looks familiar. So let's uh, duplicate that and change index to compact. Uh, keep looking. It's all too complicated. Uh, at the file we're just in, I'm pretty sure we're safe there. Oh, here we go, more indexes. Duplicate. Compact. Uh, oh, there's one more here. Uh, I think we're looking good. Yeah, I'm feeling good about that. Let's go. Let's uh, recompile this. So that one's... Ah, so we still have false, but we don't have null. So we've got progress. Uh, yeah, that should have worked, so. <laughs> Live coding for you. We're partway there. But uh, I'm not going to try and fix that on stage. So we laugh and we giggle, but that's how a majority of LibSAS development happens. Um, don't tell your managers. If you want to keep using LibSAS, they may have beef with that. Um, cool. So I'm Zypher. You can find me on that on anything. Uh, and stay sassy.